Amen to that. Hey, uh, what's your name? That's right. I am Will, and I am all souls. We together are all souls different on purpose. For such a time as this, in such a season as this, God has created us to be the one place on the face of the planet that can show the world what unity and diversity looks like. We together are All Souls Community Church, and it is indeed a beautiful thing. That's what this entire sermon series is about. And so without further ado, I'm going to invite Kristen to come on up, and she's going to read for us. But as is our habit, whether you're at home or here, will you stand with us as we read the scripture together? Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, "'Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter.' He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, Who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful that you saw through the the quarters of time that there would be a moment in our lives, in our world, in our country, when we would need to hear the words of the book of Acts. Lord, we confess that on some level that's every day, but there are particular times when a a particular word seems just to to hit, to land precisely where we need it to. And we're asking that, Lord, you would open our ears and our hearts to hear that this morning. Your voice, your instruction, your comfort, your majesty in what we look at this morning. From this passage, the truth therein. And so, God, whatever we have brought in here this morning that is distracting us, that is crushing us, that is, that is eating us away from the inside out. We, we cut those bonds in Jesus' name. We cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And instead, we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come in and to have your way in us and through us. Lord, we want to confess like we did when we sang that song in full surrender. I don't know everything. I'm not always right. I don't always understand what you're doing. I'm prone to judge. My pride is huge, bigger than I know. Yet you love me. You're for me. You're for us. And together, we get to grow up into Jesus, who is our head. So God, have your way. Even this morning, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I have a dream. 
It's a speech that you've heard probably thousands and thousands of times. It's a speech that you know comes from Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. On the, the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, 1963, as he's marching for civil rights in the civil rights movement, and he says this, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Raise your hand if you've heard that before. <laughs> that's, that's all of us, right? We've all heard that. We, we, it all resonates with us. It's probably the most quoted part of that speech. But the question for us this morning is, what on earth does that mean? What does it mean when he says, I want my children to grow up in a world where they're judged not by their skin color, but by the content of their character? What does this pastor dream about? Make no mistake, I emphasize the reverend part on purpose. Dr. Martin Luther King was a pastor before he was anything else in the civil rights movement. He was a pastor, so he was dreaming a particular dream, and I want to let you in on where we're going this morning. He was dreaming a dream of heaven. He was casting vision for what he read in the Bible, what he believed Jesus was about, and beloved, what we are to be about. Our Jesus was talking all about heaven on earth. Or to put it differently, he was talking about what we as the church are supposed to be as we live in this world, a taste of heaven on earth. Or like our theme is for this morning, the church is different cultures, or you could fill in races there, but one family on purpose. The church is different cultures, but one family on purpose. And to unpack that, we're going to look at three points. And I want to ask that you bear with me for the first one, because we have to get there with the first one. But the first point is, what is our primary identity? The second is, what does, uh, why does that matter? And then the third is, what are we to do? So the first, what is our primary identity? The other way to ask that question is, who are you? Who are you? We often answer that question in a variety of ways. I am a man. I answer it in terms of my gender, right? I am white. I answer it in terms of my race. I am Irish, English, Native American, and, and, Amer and American, right? We answer it in terms of our ethnicity. We've got a myriad of ways to answer that question, but none of those ways is enough. They're not wrong. They're just not enough. How are they not enough? Because they're not primary, they can't bear the weight that we want to put on them. Let me use an example to explain. Many of you are aware of the guy on the left in this, this picture here, right? He's the greatest basketball player of all time. His name is Michael Jordan. Some of you might think it's LeBron James, but you're wrong. So it's Michael Jordan, the, the greatest basketball player of all time, right? So this is him. Many of you may not have known that he was also a Boy Scout. Before he was MJ, the Bulls basketball star, he was a Boy Scout who wore the sash with all the merit badges, which is probably part of how he got to be so great at what he does. That builds character in you, Boy Scouts. We host Troop 21 in, in, our, in our building, and they're wonderful, and it does a lot for them, right? But here's the, here's the thing. What if Michael Jordan decided to make Boy Scout his primary identity? Let me put it to you differently. What if Michael Jordan decided that he was going to show up to practice the first day in Chicago wearing his Boy Scout sash? And not only was he going to wear the sash with all the merit badges, but he was then going to insist that everyone else needs to wear it too. In order to be a Chicago Bull, you need to also be and primarily be a Boy Scout. If he did that, you'd think to yourself, that's nuts. That's crazy. That doesn't work, right? Like, you'd think he's out of his mind. And yet, the reality is, we do that all the time. We take a, an identity that is too small to hold the weight that we're expecting it to hold, and we try to apply it out there. So we do it with race, in other words. That thing that we've inherited, that people can see on the outside, that we oftentimes just limit to skin color, but it's not, it's not simply skin color. But we say, hey, look, like, I am white. Well, that's true, but that's not enough. Why? Because the moment I make my primary identity something that I have different from you, that you can't possibly share with with me, guess what I breed? Division. Division. 
Similarly, when it comes to our ethnicity, when we say, here's who I am first, I'm Italian, eh, right? Like, like I, love, I love my pasta, I love my whatever, and I realize I'm being totally racist when I say stuff like that, right? Like, but I love my pasta and all my stuff too, and I've, I've got great Italians in my family, and I love them. But here's the reality, right? The moment we make our customs and traditions who we are, that's our primary identity, then we have automatically started to judge those around us who don't share the same primary identity. Because when you're different, different means that there's some sort of value being placed on that difference. And as you place that value on that difference, you're either saying, I'm worse than you or I'm better than you. And that's what breeds, what's that D word we said before? Division. Division. It's too small when we take these little divisions, these little classifications about who we are and try try to have them bear the weight of our primary identity. One of the ways we know we do this is because the the flip side of that happens all the time. We say, oh, well, I can't do that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go really big. We're going to go really general. And so here's what unites us all. We're all human. And that is the most basic Definition, the most basic thing all of us have in common. But the problem is it's too general. It's too general. Nobody in here goes around thinking, you know what, I'm a human today, right? Like, or here's my identity, I'm human, right? Like, we don't think in those terms because it feels like we're given a number and not a name. It feels like we don't have a face. We're not known. There's no value when we're all just human, too general, It's too general. So what's the answer? What do we need? Well, what we need is a primary identity that can include all, even as each part is known and valued. Do you get that? A primary identity that can actually include everyone, but is, gives each part value and a sense of being known. That's what we need, and that's why what we need is Jesus. Who he is and what he did. Because when we have Jesus, listen, please don't miss this. Jesus is the one who came to show us what it means to be truly human. He was 100% God, that's not us, but he was also 100% Holy Spirit-filled man. He's the one who showed us what we were always made to be, truly human. And so when we see his uninterrupted communion with the Father, when we see his love for and willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of his neighbor and even his enemy, when we see him walking with some sort of energy and having power in his prayers that we don't even necessarily recognize, that we're thinking, how do we even get there? That's Jesus showing us what it means to be human. Human. But he doesn't just show us what it means to be human. Because if he just showed us, that wouldn't be enough. If he just showed us, then we'd have a great example that we could never actually emulate, and it would just be discouraging and disappointing. Instead, Jesus says, I've come to do something in my life, my death, and my resurrection. I've come to give you that same Holy Spirit that's going to make you like me. Or let me put it to you differently. I've come to start you over, to make you fresh again, or to use Jesus' words that he used when he was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. I've come that you might be born again. And right away, if you're listening, you're like, well, does that mean I'm supposed to go back into my mother's womb? That was Nicodemus's question. Am I supposed to go through the, the physical birth process again? No. You're to be born again by the Spirit of God. There's a new DNA inside of you. It's God's DNA. It's Holy Spirit DNA. I'm making a new family so that, listen, please don't miss this. What unites you is on the inside. It's on the inside. And what is different about you, what is diverse about you, what is not the same about you, is the expression of the unity on the inside. We are one family, one body, with different parts on purpose, so that what comes out of us, what we see on the outside, is not what's different, but an expression of the majesty of our oneness, of our unity of the church. Amen Amen is right. Amen is right. That's what's in view in Acts chapter 11 for us this morning. 
You may have missed it. And we're not going to unpack all the details of it because the details of Acts 11, they matter, but for today, they don't matter as much. Why? Because it's the primary point of Acts 11 that matters, which is simply this. The church, as it was getting started, had the same question that we ask all the time. Is the church going to be unified by what's on the outside or by what's on the inside? They didn't know to ask it that way, but that's what they were asking when they came and said, wait, are, is the church supposed to be really Jewish? Because God's chosen people were the Jews, Jesus was a Jew, and all the first followers were Jews. I don't know if you were unaware of that, but that's the case. And so they're all Jews, and so they're wondering, is our ethnicity what it means to be Christian? And in no uncertain terms, God shows them, it is not about your ethnicity. It is about your DNA, the spirit inside of you, your family. Because as Peter goes and does what he thinks is crazy, he goes and he sits down at a table with, with Gentiles, with the unclean, and, and they're serving unclean things. And he's like, wait a second, I've never, I, I don't touch unclean things. I'm not supposed to be around unclean things. What's going on here? Aren't we supposed to be Jewish in order to be Christian? And God says, no, 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 you don't understand. You've misunderstood what it meant to be Jewish. The Jews had clean laws and a whole bunch of moral laws because they were on the planet for really two reasons. To show the world who God is. He's holy, and we cannot work our way up to him. They kept failing for a reason. But also, in the middle of that mess, to show that God is gracious, and through their failings, who does God bring to, to earth through the Jewish people? But the Messiah, Jesus, the King. And so for, for us to think that, God says, you're my chosen people because I want to elevate your ethnicity above all others, is to misunderstand why he was using the Jews to begin with. It doesn't mean God doesn't have a special place in his heart for them. Even now, he does because Jesus came through the Jewish people. But the purpose of the nation of Israel in God's redemptive history was to show us our need for Jesus and then fulfill that need. You following? And so the question was, how Jewish do you need to be in order to be Christian? And God's answer was, you've asked the wrong question. What makes you Christian is not what you do on the outside. It's who you have on the inside. Holy Spirit-filled family. That's what it means to be Christian. And in case you missed it, Jesus' call you're thinking, well, wait a second, isn't that a division? Some are Christians, some are not. Aren't you missing something here, Pastor? Well, here's the reality. Did Jesus come and say, only the Jews can come to me? Or did he say, only the Gentiles can come to me? Or oh, only, the, only the Italians, I picked on them, so let me pick on them again. Only the Italians can come to me, or the Romans, as they used to call them. Is that what Jesus says? Or does he actually say, everyone, all who are weak and heavy laden, Everyone come to me, and I will give you rest. I will make you just right. I'll make you family. Are you following along? This is a radical difference from anything you're going to read on social media. It's a radical difference from anything you're going to see in the news media. But this is the truth that all of that is trying to approximate and missing because we're making our primary identity an identity that cannot hold the weight of your actual identity. It breeds division rather than unity. It breeds division rather than unity. In fact, or, 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 juxtaposed rather, to what it means to be Christian, what that brings actual unity through diversity. And that's where we're going next. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Well, first it matters because we make this mistake all the time. Here's what we say. In order to be really Christian, you need to be Catholic, or you need to be Baptist, or you need to be Presbyterian. You need to be fill in the blank. In order to be Christian, you need to be. In order to be Christian, you need to be Republican. In order to be Christian, you need to be Democrat. In order to be Christian, you need to be American, or at least Western. And so when we send missionaries overseas, we're going to bring our Western culture with us, because that's what it truly means to be Christian, right? Wrong. We also say, in order to be Christian, you need to be white. Or black. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who says that? Who says that, Pastor? I don't say that, really. You know what the number one most segregated day of the week is? Sunday. 
Because we don't say with our mouths, we speak with our actions that in order to be Christian, you need to be whatever color looks like me, which is, friends, one of the things, by God's grace, I am so grateful for here at All Souls. I'm so grateful. Amen. Amen. So grateful. I said to him, and I don't know if I've shared this with you guys recently, but when we first planted All Souls, this is what I said to God in no uncertain terms, God. If you give me an all-white church, I'm leaving. Now, God would have probably made me stay if that was his plan, right? Like, I don't get to tell God what I'm doing, but I was pretty honest with him, like wrestling. God, I want our church to reflect our community. And so if we're in the middle of Kansas, maybe then we have an all-white church. If we're in the middle of Rockland, we have a church that looks like Rockland. And I believe we do. And that is to our benefit. Why? Because otherwise what we do is we walk around like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts with a merit badge sash across our chest. And we say, here are my merits. Here's what gives me value. I'm white. Or I'm Asian. Or I'm Native American. And you're not. Or I'm, 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 I'm German, or I'm Irish, or I'm Somali, or I'm fill in the blank, Australian, and you're not. You see, you, we don't say it like that, but that's what it means when we are dividing ourselves up into all these little chunks. Not that those things aren't true, they're just not true enough. They're just not heavy, weighty, strong enough if that's our primary identity. We do it all the time, and so we need to have our eyes open to it. But in, in addition to having our eyes open to the mistake, please don't miss the majesty. We need to have our eyes open to this because when God said in the beginning, let us make man in our image, God could have made, made man all white vanilla. He could have made mankind all chocolate. He could have made mankind all strawberry. But he had to, listen, had to make mankind all different flavors, colors, races, ethnicities. Why? Because he was making us, what was it again? In his image. That means when we look around and we see all these different flavors of what it means to be human, what are we getting a flavor of, a taste of, a delight in? God, God. We don't know God the same way unless and until we know him through differences in one another. Let me give you some pictures to illustrate what I'm talking about here. I was in my middle 20s before I knew what sticky rice was. I missed out, friends. I missed out. I missed out on the beauty and the delight of having this rice that's kind of like grits, but different. They all, st it sticks together on its own. And then when you put a piece of sushi on top of that, it melts in your mouth. I didn't know what that even tasted like, what it looked like, how to even use chopsticks until I was in my 20s. What's the point I'm making? God gives us certain things through other cultures that help us to begin to taste and see that he's made us to delight in life, to delight in this world and in the treasures and gifts that he's given us through other people and other cultures. What about the first time you heard a British accent, whether through 007 or somebody else, and you thought, wow, that sounds so cool. I want to keep listening. That guy sounds smarter than me, right? Like, isn't that true? The, the Brits, they get like an extra 10 points on the uh, IQ scale just because of the way that they speak. There's something about their voice that makes you want to keep listening. Well, I, I would somewhat tongue-in-cheek push us to see that when you hear a beautiful accent, whether British or otherwise, what you're recognizing is we have been made to respond to the word, to respond to the voice of one who is beautiful, one who is intelligent, one who knows us, one who delights in us, the one who speaks and there is, the one who comforts us with his word, who whispers to us when we're in our worst moments, who sings praises over us to lift us up and to help us to begin to believe that we are actually more valuable, more valuable than we'd ever dare dream. Are you following me? 
What about brown people time? That's the phrase that my sister Roz came up with that she told me like, I don't know how many years ago now, 12 years. She said, I'm on brown people time. I said, what on earth is that? She said, brown people time means two things. It means you don't ever show up on time, right? So that's something we had to get used to on staff when she was on staff. But brown people time also meant this. There was no rush to leave. So when other cultures would be ready to just get out the door because there's stuff to do, Roz would sit at my house and wait and linger and listen. And her presence just opened up hearts so that we got to know one another on levels that I would have never known her otherwise if she wasn't functioning with a different ethnic idea of how to manage your time in your life. I was blessed by that. I've learned from that. I've tried to emulate that brown people time in my own life. What about when you come to the end of life? And all of a sudden, you're faced with the prospect of, of losing. Or you've just lost someone that you love. And you read in the scriptures this, this weird combination. I, I want you to mourn with hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, right? That's the, the promise that we have in Jesus, that we have hope in all things. No matter what, we have hope, even in death. And yet, when you're standing at the grave of someone that you've just lost, and you're overwhelmed by that reality, and you're like, Lord, I don't know how these things fit together. I can't open up my heart to that. And then the Irish or Scottish bagpiper starts, amazing grace. It's almost as if the heavens open up, and you can begin to hear the angels singing, glory to God in the highest, even as you hear God the Father through his spirit saying to you, I'm with you, I love you, I will care for you. At the very same time, grief, sorrow like you've never known, and at the very same moment, hope and joy and life. We wouldn't know that if it wasn't for the bagpipes playing at our funerals. Are you getting what, what we're trying to even approach here? That there's a reality to being the church that's all about being different on purpose. Our ethnicities, our races, they help us to see who he is. They help us to hear his voice, to know his heart, to taste his delight in ways we would never know before. But now we can because we're in this life together. One Family, DNA on the inside for all unites us all so that the differences on the outside help us to flavor that unity and understand him all the more. All right, if that's true, third point, what are we to do? What does this look like? How do we live this out? Well, I'm reading a book right now. It's called The Roadmap to Reconciliation by Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil. In that book, she has spent the last 20 plus years doing the work, studying the work, writing about, speaking about the work of specifically racial reconciliation. She's hired as a consultant all over the world to help with this, and she says something incredibly provocative. She says, training doesn't work which is kind of weird because she's hired to do training. So I'm just putting that out there. But training doesn't work. What does she mean by that? Well, she means a particular kind of training. Training where we're just going to learn different ways to behave with one another, different things that we should say or shouldn't say. It doesn't work. It doesn't help us to actually know oneness and to, to bridge the gap. Well, if, if training doesn't work, what, what does work? Well, she says one thing. One thing works. What is that one thing? Well, it's called a dream. It was a dream that first belonged to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Let me put that to you differently. 
It's the very same thing that Peter got in trouble for doing in our passage this morning. When he went to the house of Cornelius the Gentile and sat at his table, eating his food and getting to know him in a way that he couldn't possibly know him otherwise. It's the very same thing that Jesus did when he walked the earth and he went up to those even within his own Jewish tribe, like Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the short little guy, who everyone hated tax collectors because they were traitors. So if you're going to be really Jewish, a true Jew, a true follower of Yahweh the King, you don't associate with them. And Jesus said, think again. Those are the ones that I've come for. You are the ones that I've come for. And so I'm going to go home with you, Zacchaeus. And I'm going to sit at your table. I'm going to eat your food. I'm going to hear your stories. And then I'm going to tell you mine. We have been given a powerful key that unlocks, friends, so much of the division and the divide that we think we have to live with. And it is all about the table, sitting at the table together. Let me give you an example of what that looks like in our context. There are two. There are many here at All Souls. I think this is one of the things we do well. But there are two in particular, Winslow and Yvonne Osborne in this picture. They are from Guyana, and uh, if you go to their house, which if you've not been invited, that's simply because they don't have your email address. They've invited basically everyone this side of the Mason-Dixon line to their house for dinner. And they go out of their way to make sure that you are loved. So you sit down for appetizers that are more than what you'd eat in a normal meal. And then you go to the meal, which again is just overflowing with food. And then you get to the first dessert. I mentioned first dessert because second dessert comes after first dessert. And by the time they roll you out of their house, you've realized something. You've just been loved in a way you didn't anticipate. You now know and love Guyana like you could have never known or loved before because you've tasted Winslow's. They call it pepper sauce. We call it hot sauce. You will, it, is, it will knock your socks off. So little bits, little bits, okay, little bits. But when you taste that, and when you hear the stories, and when they open their hearts to you, and when they ask about you and your household and, and your heritage and, and where you come from, and you begin to understand one another, you begin to taste and see and delight in the differences that help us understand our God because we are all, at the end of the day, one. One family, one spirit, one DNA, one Lord, one Father over all and in all when you go to their home, and not just theirs. But man, they do a great job, do they not? Yeah. Amen, amen. Now, why is this the case? This is our last point, or our last, the last thing I'll say this morning. This is the case simply because the dream that Dr. Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King had, and the facts that Dr. McNeil found out in, in 20 years of research and the life that Jesus lived and how he lived it have always revolved around a different dream. That dream that God calls heaven. In Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back, God says it's gonna look like this. A really long table with your seat at it with every tribe and nation and tongue gathered together so that together we could be with our Jesus. Together, we will reflect the wonder and the beauty of who he is all around that table and we will begin to understand all the more why we were so different to begin with because look at our Jesus. Look at him. He's beautiful. He's majestic. He is so intricate. There are layers upon layers upon layers of who he is in his identity that I will spend all of eternity diving into, delighting in, being overwhelmed with, and I will never reach the end of Jesus. Do you, are you starting to get to see a picture as to why it matters that we're so different from one another and yet the same? Why it matters that we do the one thing that our text for us points to this morning. 
table fellowship, that we begin to dream a different dream with our mouths, with our ears, with our hearts. All Souls Community Church, I'm challenging us to let this next season be a season where we share the table together, where we go out of our way to invite those who don't look like us, who don't speak like us, who don't cook like us, who don't believe like us to our table, and where we accept their invitation to theirs, and where we linger and spend the time and delight in and get to know our Jesus all the more through his body. Did I hear an amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. You have had a dream from the beginning, Lord. And we saw it in the garden. And we anticipated in the next garden, the new city, heaven. But God, you've told us that now is the time, right now, is the time for the church to be the place where heaven and earth meet where we are experiencing the wonder and power and majesty of being different ethnicities, different races on purpose so we can know you all the more. What an honor. What an amazing honor and privilege it is to delight in one another and there see your eyes looking back at us. There taste your delight there hear your words of affirmation and value. There find home, warmth, invitation, and the love that transforms us from the inside out. We already know it's true. We want more of you, Jesus. So here we are again. Arms open wide. And surrender. Surrender. Thank you for this very concrete way to walk in surrender and delight. Sharing food together, sharing life together, growing up together. Yes. Yes, we will. Help us, Lord, and fill us to that end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.